How is everybody doing this morning? Great? All right, good. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, very honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thank you, Jeremy, for uh, inviting me over here. <clears throat> so today I'm really excited to share with you my perspective on what it takes to design companies for the types of changes, the unique changes that we have and that we face within the 21st century. So before I get into the meat of my talk, uh, just a, a bit of background on who I am and what I've done. So over the past 20 years, I've worked um, primarily within Silicon Valley at uh, these four companies that I think have done a fairly good job at innovating in the face of change. Most recently, I was the global head of design at Uber, where I led a team of around 200 designers, researchers, writers, and design technologists. And currently, I head up a team of uh, designers and researchers at Airbnb. We focus on the homes business, which drives 97% of Airbnb's primary business. And I also wear, I wear two hats there. The other uh, role that I play is a general manager of the guest experience. That's the experience when you go to Airbnb's app, you're searching, you decide which home you're interested in, and then you ultimately book, and then you have an experience. We start designing the service when you're on trip into your check-in and making sure you have a great experience at the listing itself. So I've sat on both sides of the table. You know, I'm primarily a designer by training uh, and, by, and by sort of soul. Um, but at the same time, I also have uh, a very significant portion of my time is spent within the context of uh, leading a, a large business. Okay, so these are four very distinct companies, but they have one thing in common. That is that they have adapted in the face of change over the last, uh, some of them over the last 20 years. They've been very effective at doing that. And so to talk about these, I, there's three forces of change that I think are, are really important. They apply to all businesses. And so to describe these, I'm going to tell a story of a happy little company that grows larger. And then as this company adds more employees, it's out into the world, it faces its first force of change, which is technological change, okay? Um, it, during this conference, and, and just in general, we've talked about a number of different mega trends in technology. I'd like to just highlight four of them right now. The first is smartphone technology. A third of the world's population has a powerful microcomputer in their pocket. 11 years ago, nobody had smartphones. Um, what's interesting there is that two-thirds of the world doesn't yet have a smartphone. There's a lot of opportunity in this space. It's pretty incredible. There's also global internet connectivity. 3.3 billion people across the world are connected to the internet. You combine that with smartphones, you get this connected society that's connecting commerce, that's socializing, creating communities all across the world. I took this photo from our uh, friends at Soul Machines. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, is also a, uh, a, a mega trend. Five years ago, we weren't talking about this. Now we're socializing with um, these humanistic you know, uh, interfaces that are predicting um, what we, you know, what we need to do and what they need to educate us on. Um, this is also a pretty significant megatrend that, that applies across multiple business sectors, as we saw yesterday. And then lastly, this is, you know, really interesting and also very creepy, which is sort of the rise of robotics um, <clears throat> and, and automation. But this is going to have a material impact on the workforce in the future. Now, interestingly, at, at Uber, for example, <clears throat> all four of these factors came to bear on the work that we did. Uber only exists because of a smartphone and the fact that smartphone is, is connected to the internet. That's the way you hailed an Uber cab. Started in San Francisco, the fact that the world's global population has smartphones means that Uber was able to branch out to India, Southeast Asia, of course, China, the rest of the world. Now, Uber also has an autonomous vehicle unit. That's their, one of their primary differentiators versus other um, ride-sharing companies. AI and mechanics, that's really what's at the core of, of AV technology. Um, so Uber basically is playing within this entire space, and as the forces of technology shift and change, Uber, of course, as you probably know, is an extremely innovative company that is working with these forces of technological change. They're leveraging them. The next big force of change is customer expectations. Your customers have always have had expectations, but what I think is unique about the 21st century is that we now care more about our customers, and that's one of the great things being here and listening to some of the presentations, it seems like this audience is very much aware of the need to listen to your customers' needs and wants and desires. What's great about your customers is this is the fundamental truth. They will never, ever be satisfied. No matter what you do, they will never be satisfied with the work you do. So, but, but that's the quest. The quest is to understand them distinctly and deeply and to respond. Actually take their dissatisfaction and do something with it, okay? Now, the third force of change is internal. So those first two are external. The third is internal. And this is really your employees' expectations of you as an employer. Okay, your employees are the energy source within your company. Unless you have motivated, engaged employees, you won't be able to respond to the changes that you see in the world. Now, this is fairly obvious, but you know, we don't have employees like yesteryear when people are just punching in a clock, you know, coming in nine to five. 
Now employees in this day and age, especially younger employees, are looking at their, their place of work as a true source of personal meaning and personal fulfillment. And we, we, we owe it to them to provide that. Okay, so these are the three primary forces of change that face all companies. Um, and, and your company may have different forces of change. So for example, at Airbnb and Uber, regulations are a huge force of change and they're very difficult to predict. But those apply to the company specifically. I think these three forces of change apply to all companies. And so we see our small company is growing and it's adapted. And that's the goal, actually, I think, of, of any company is to be able to adapt and thrive in the face of change. And so to do that, <clears throat> it's important to have a 21st century company design. And so I propose three building blocks uh, for this company design. The first is to have a humanistic mission. You know, we've talked about the, the why and how important that is, the purpose of your company. You know, why do you exist? Why do your employees care? Why do your customers care? That's at the foundation, okay? It's the most elemental block. Then we have innovative culture that's layered on top of it. This is really around the cultural values at your company that are encouraging your employees who are attracted by your humanistic mission to then innovate. And then the last is design thinking. So um, when I talk about design thinking, again, I, you know, I actually agree with Larry that design thinking isn't this panacea that's going to solve every problem that your company has. You have to have support within the company to invest in innovation for this to even matter. But the way that I think about design thinking is as a product development methodology. It's a way to develop products and services and experiences that requires deep customer empathy and a response to them. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we do design thinking at, at Airbnb. Okay, but let's jump in first to humanistic mission. Okay, so why, why is a humanistic mission important? Well, um, first and foremost, it's because it's the right thing. <laughs> uh, life on Earth is important. Sustainability is important. Making sure that people are fulfilled uh, in, their, in their lives and in their careers is important. But also, it's important to attract and retain the right types of employees. And the way that I think of employees is as humans, but they're also these spark plugs of innovation. You need to make sure that they are motivated and that they're passionate about the mission in order to make sure that you've got that energy that you need to drive change within your company. And so when I think about, you know, what is the bigger mission? You know, why are we here? I think, you know, it's, I think it, for me, fundamentally, is to help humanity. That, that is the reason why we are, you know, on this earth. It's the reason why we create businesses. It's not to maximize shareholder value or to maximize profit or to disrupt for disruption's sake. I mean, this is kind of the goal. The goal of sustainability ultimately is to help the Earth, and it's, this is our spaceship that we're traveling through the cosmos in, and that ultimately will help humanity sustain into the future so we can keep on doing cool stuff. Um, but really, this is, I think this is the goal. And after all, you know, people are the ones who are consuming the goods and services that we create, and society is really our primary stakeholder. And so what I'd like to do now is walk you through a number of, um, I mean, you could call these micro case studies. I've essentially taken a look at the um, mission statements from these three very innovative companies, and I'll, I'll just talk about each one of them in turn. So first is Uber's. Their mission statement is to ignite opportunity by setting the world in motion. And the key sort of points here are opportunity. You know, Uber's really focused now. They've pivoted away from just being a transportation company and winning at all costs to one where they want opportunity for drivers for riders and for businesses that build on Uber Eats or on their freight platform or on their autonomous platform. And their goal here is worldwide. They're differentiating from other competitors in ride sharing. Uber is a worldwide company. Now let's look at this in comparison to Lyft. Their mission statement is to reconnect people through transportation and bring communities together. So they're really focusing on the humanistic aspect um, of, of their mission. And uh, if you're interested, after my presentation, I can tell you about the battles between Uber and Lyft in 2017, where, in fact, the mission statements of both companies um, dictated the outcome, the business outcome of those companies that year. Um, Uber had some significant challenges in 2017. There was the Susan Fowler in incident, which was very horrible, and then there was a uh, delete Uber campaign that followed close after that. And Lyft was, at the time, uh, really declining in market share. They were on the ropes, and after those two events, Lyft just dramatically increased market share. People migrated over to Lyft because of their mission statement and their brand promise that came as a result of it. So I can tell you more about that story if you're interested. The last one here is Airbnb. And this one obviously is near and dear to my heart. Um, this mission statement is one of the reasons why I decided to join Airbnb from Uber. Airbnb exists to create a world where anyone can belong anywhere. Now, what's great about this mission statement is that it is such a lofty, aspirational goal. You know, when we think about attaining this goal, we don't think about one year or 10 year or even 20 year timeframes. 
The conditions that would need to exist for everyone to belong anywhere uh, is, is a world where there's no bias, there's no discrimination. You know, anybody from across the world would have the same level of trust as you trust your, your next door neighbor. And so when we think about this mission, we call this a mission with an infinite time horizon. We don't know when we're going to attain this mission, but this is the goal. And when I come to work every day, I know that the, the energy that I put into work, you know, I'm one of those innovative spark plugs within the context of Airbnb, the energy I put into work is going to have an output that ratchets up to this high level mission and purpose. And so I'm motivated to do that. And it's not just me. Uh, there was a survey by Deloitte that indicated that two-thirds of millennials choose their company based on mission. And four-fifths of millennials need a higher purpose to be satisfied at work. Attracting and retaining employees is about having the right kind of mission. And it's my belief that, you know, whether you're a small company, whether you're a company that just works in New Zealand, um, just being, being able to elevate, just take a step back and elevate your mission. Think about how to elevate it to a higher level. Uh, can you elevate it to a level where it might have a a bigger impact within the world. It's, it's really important to attract uh, these new employees. So ultimately, employees want to work at a company that changes the world you know, for the better. And if you can develop a mission that, um, that attracts these types of employees, it's that, that's the foundation. That's the foundation upon which um, this 21st century design is, is all based on. So once you have that humanistic mission, now we can move into innovative culture. So to start here, what is culture? Uh, I'll give you a very quick primer. So culture is essentially values. You know, these are the behaviors that we want to encourage in the people who are part of our, our tribe. The beliefs that we have, these are the things that we hold to be true. This is often timed, tied to our purpose and mission. Our customs, these are things like, you know, rituals that we have at work, happy hour. Or there's um, some companies that I know of where they start every meeting by staring into each other's eyes for three minutes in silence. Um, <laughs> This is one of my buddies, actually, uh, Abe, who uh, runs Outlier. Um, they, he told me he do that. He did they do this, and I, uh, I was like, that's very interesting practice. Um, <laughs> I can you probably have a very high level of focus in those meetings. Um, and then lastly, there's, there's language. So it's, these are the words you use at your, in, your, in your organization, your tribe. So for example, at Airbnb, we have a rule, no TLAs, no three-letter acronyms. We want to have clear, simple, straightforward language. If you develop a project, if you have a process, don't give it a TLA. Just call it by its name. Be straight. Okay, so, but today we're going to focus on values. Uh, but not all types of values. We're going to focus on the values that I've seen within some very innovative companies help drive innovation and set behavioral expectations that then help uh, lead towards better innovation. So, so, when you think about values, you know, as a founder, you start a company uh, and the values are the things that, you, that essentially express the behavior you want your employees to, to uh, have. And as, a few people join the company, you would communicate those values to them, and uh, sometimes you might write them down and codify them if you're early stages. Um, but you can also reward employees, and so behavior that is aligned with your values is often rewarded, and so people will notice who's being rewarded, and they'll emulate those people. And what I've seen is that as then as companies grow, what can often happen is there's this bi-directional relationship between the employees and the work they do and the success they have made via their behaviors. And then the, the, the values that the founder wants to sort of codify. So this actually happened at, at Uber, um, interestingly. So the city teams at Uber uh, were, in, in the, the, they still are somewhat like this, but um, when I was working there, you know, they were a, a set of people who were essentially always confronting you know, regulation, city governments, oftentimes operating in illegal environments. So they had to adopt a very aggressive stance in order to win at all cost. And it worked. And so the success that they had, the behaviors that led to that success, were then codified and brought into Uber's overarching cultural values. And you'll see, I'll show you Uber 1.0's cultural values compared to 2.0. I think that was one of the, the challenges that Uber had, is that it actually developed a set of somewhat aggressive cultural values that didn't set it on the right path, and those values became weaponized. In any case, over time then, um, what you can do is use your cultural values to understand which type of employees are appropriate for your company. So that at Airbnb, for example, we have cultural values interviewers. And so when you interview at Airbnb, there's two interview sessions that you have where there's some people who understand our cultural values and they will evaluate whether Airbnb is a fit for you and whether you're a fit for Airbnb. This is part of our interview process that ensures that the culture at Airbnb sustains over time. And then lastly, and perhaps more importantly, having a clear set of values and a mission and a purpose helps align everybody in your company, okay? So we'll see that one of the values of innovation is allowing people to work autonomously and take risks. Well, if you don't have that alignment, it's a, it's a recipe for chaos. And if you do have the alignment, then you've got these, 
these spark plugs of innovation all working autonomously, focusing on customer you know, challenges that they can utilize to then figure out how to adapt and change within your organization, you can be very successful with that. Okay, so what we'll do now is take a look at the cultural values across three highly innovative companies, and then we'll do some organization. I sort of design these values and to make some meaning of them. So first is Google. Uh, I was at Google for four and a half years. You know, these, these values are you know, definitely reiterated with people who join there. Um, these are their overarching values. I want to focus on the ones that I really feel drive their innovative culture, focusing on the user. They say user, customer, or you know, people. I, I typically don't like the term user, but they focus on the user and all else will follow. Fast is better than slow. You can be serious without a suit, and great isn't good enough. So this passion for excellence. Let's take a look now at Uber. This is Uber 1.0 cultural values. These are the ones that were established by TK, Travis Kalanick. You can see the values in the left-hand column. Extremely aggressive, super pumpedness, always be hustling, meritocracy and toe stepping, principled confrontation. Pretty, pretty interesting. I mean, that's, that's what led to some of the challenges, I believe, that Uber had in 2017 and ultimately the shift in leadership. Here are Uber's 2.0 values. So when Dara, Uber's CEO, joined, he knew that he had to shift the company's culture in a different direction. So they redesigned the values and rolled them out across the company, okay? So one of the ones that I like here is we do the right thing. And what they say within Uber is we do the right thing, period. It's really important. Like, there's no questions. It's not about winning. It's about doing the right thing. It's re they had to really focus a lot on that. And that's why they put the period on it, <laughs> because there's no excuses. You have to do the right thing, um, even if it means that you might not win a certain market. So here are the innovative values. Again, customer obsession. One I like here is we value ideas over hierarchy. This is really about the ideas coming from the bottom up in the organization versus being cast only from the top down. And next, Amazon's. So I think of Amazon as like the grandfather of cultural values. You know, Jeff Bezos established these values early on in Amazon's life cycle, and they've, of course, been one of the most innovative companies in history. Um, and they've got quite a few values here that are focused on innovation. You know, almost the majority of their values, or half of their values, are focused on innovation. So now let's take this set of innovative cultural values across these companies, bring them into a cloud. Here we go. So these are all the values. And then we'll apply a process of organization. This is organization that I've done. You might disagree with it. But I think we have six primary categories upon which you can categorize your cultural values that are associated with innovation. And within these categories, there are two primary buckets. So the first one is how we work. And the second one is who we are. Okay, so let's focus on how we work. First is customer obsessed. This is the one that we've talked a lot about being very empathetic, understanding your customers. But the key here is not just understanding what customer problems you have, it's actually taking action on those problems. I can't tell you how many times within the context of the companies that I've worked at, we've known about a customer issue, but we lower it as a priority versus something we know will drive growth. The trick here is being customer obsessed and just rooting out every one of those challenges your customers faces that you think is worthy of, 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 of actually, you know, it's, it's, a real, it's a real challenge, and then addressing it. The next one is appetite for risk. So this one is interesting. It's really prioritizing risk-taking and exploration from all levels of the company versus hierarchy and efficiency. This top-down sort of mandate, we're going to do this, we're going this direction, now everybody get in line can be extremely efficient, but this is the kind of, of sort of command structure that some of those S&P 500 companies that no longer exist had, right? Versus having a more nimble, decentralized organization where your units of innovation, your employees are able to make their own decisions and identify problems for you. The next is speed. This one's super critical. And this is about anti-bureaucracy. Um, so Bezos has another sort of <coughs> concept, which is day one companies versus day two companies. And he, he wrote this into a shareholder letter. Day one companies are companies like startups. It's what, companies where the CEO is actually sitting with their customers. They work with their customers on a daily basis. You've got small teams, usually a few set of people in the companies. You can make decisions at a lightning quick speed, and you can, you can, you can just do them really quick. Now, day two companies are ones where you, you know, grow from 10 people to 100 people to 1,000 people, 10,000 people. You develop processes. You, be, you develop matrix decision-making systems. You have to have DACI models and RACI models. And ultimately, those companies start to calcify. You've got CEOs who haven't talked to their customers in over a year, three months. They don't know who their customers are anymore. These are companies where decision-making slows down dramatically. These are companies that calcify and die. So the, the trick here is focusing on speed of decision-making and execution and busting through bureaucracy. 
Now, the next set of values are around the, the types of characteristics for the people you want to bring into your company. First is originality. You want to prioritize brains over appearance. That's critical. Next is owner's mentality. It's important to find employees who feel like they are their own, not just the own CEO of the company, they're not making, you know, just top-down decisions, but they feel a deep sense of ownership in the company like a CEO would. They take responsibility. When they identify a customer problem that needs to be solved, they're relentless in trying to discover ways to, to actually solve that problem. And the last one is excellence. This is about raising the bar for indiv individuals as well as groups. Um, this is an image of some folks who uh, launched uh, a series of products in, in February of 2018. These are engineers who uh, spent long hours uh, working to get this off the ground at Airbnb. Um, so I wanted to honor them here in this, this picture because they all raised the bar for each other through that experience. And when you think about this notion of innovation, people can actually apply it to themselves. You know, you, ideally you have employees that are looking at themselves and saying, okay, what changes have I noticed in my environment? Which, like, have I noticed that somebody's doing something differently and better than, than the way that I'm doing it? And can I learn to adapt that new, that new technique into my own personal practice and therefore raise the bar for myself and for others around me? Okay, so those are our six categories of innovation values. You know, hopefully, you know, you can build those into your organization by prioritizing them as leaders. And then that brings us to this last, you know, bit, which is design thinking. And if you have a humanistic mission, you've got an innovative culture, now you're able to set the table for um, developing products and services and experiences in a way that's very empathetic. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with design thinking. We've talked about it a lot. And I know that um, Better by Design, uh, and this council, and just in general, people in this room are, are, are interested in this topic. But I'm going to take you through um, a little bit of an overview here, in case you're not fully aware. But design thinking is a method for creative solutions to problem solving. But almost more important, it's a commitment by companies to adopt innovation. You can't have the first without the second. There's no use in even doing the first unless you've got the second. You can't just say, we've got a design thinking methodology and practice. Let's go. We're going to, we're, now we're going to innovate. It doesn't work that way. You have to have support from the top to make sure that the ideas that are developed through this process are actually supported. OK, so let's focus first on this method. I'm going to give you a quick overview. Obviously, we know where design thinking was originated you know, in, in IDEO, as well as the Stanford D School. It's now propagated out to many businesses and universities and business schools. Essentially, we have our three primary spaces of innovation. Inspiration, this is where the idea comes from. You, know, you, you basically get the spark of an inspiration where there's a problem to solve. And designers have been doing this for you know, almost forever. Um, and then that, that spark goes into the ideation phase, where you come up with multiple ideas. What is the best one? And then that goes into implementation. It's the how. How are you actually getting out to market? What is the way of implementing? And now, within that, there's this sort of smaller set of workflows. And I'll take you through a case study that we're actually working on at Airbnb to show how this um, actually applies and how we utilize design thinking within Airbnb. So the case study is hotels and Airbnb. Currently, Airbnb actually does have hotels on the platform, even though it's known for alternative accommodations. And we recently purchased a company called Hotel Tonight that does last minute bookings of boutique hotels. So the question is, how the hell do we get hotels onto Airbnb? What's our strategy? And so <clears throat> there's a lot of different problems to solve here. Um, but one thing that our research team did is they actually went to, to Europe and they interviewed a set of boutique hotel owners and hostel owners. Um, and then they packaged up their research findings into what I would say is a, a, you know, a ver very slick video. It's actually 10 minutes long. I've condensed it down. And the reason why they did this is because we distributed this, this video, this research finding across the organization to build greater empathy. And we actually had to apply within the context of Airbnb. We like to do things the hard way. You kind of kind of have to produce your video and apply a soundtrack to it if you want any executive to actually consume it. So uh, we've got raw data that supports a lot of the work, but this is going to look a little bit more polished than what you might produce. This is Cyril. The hotel for me is open to all the people. People are strange. Guests and the neighbors, they can really have a sort of moment where they can share what they think about the world. Laboratoire, laboratoire life. The hotel is really a question of connection with the people. Uh, that's why, in fact, the, the title of Mob is Mob Hotel of the People. We are more close to your universe, the Airbnb world than uh, our competitor in the hotel business. All right, so what was interesting about that is that th this video actually um, helped encourage us when thinking about hotels. You know, obviously the, the Mob Hotel is pretty 
awesome. It's very authentic. It's, it's authentic to its location. And so there's a lot of different other sources of research and insights that we've been able to gather. I mean, one of the ways that I like to gather research is by actually talking with our customer support agents in Ireland. I mean, they've got, they're, they're on the front line, um, and they oftentimes hear complaints that people have. In any case, in this, in this journey, we brought in that work um, and some other work that we had done. And, you know, there's a lot of different questions to answer here, like how to get hotels more bookings or how to provide reliable guest services via hotels. And instead, we want to focus on the primary, the primary problem. And so after you develop the sort of set of data, after you've empathized with your, with your customers, then the process is synthesizing that down to a problem definition. Now, I'm not going to get into other techniques to do this process, but this was the definition or point of view that then helped guide the subsequent iterations on this particular, particular slice of our solution to the greater problem of hotels and Airbnb. So we took this idea into ideation, um, and you know, ideation is really about going broad. Again, I'm not going to talk about different ideation techniques, but we wanted to come up with a number of different ideas, and typically we like to invite all different types of people to the ideation process, not just designers and researchers, but the product managers, some of our country managers, oftentimes we'll bring in a marketing manager, even somebody who's in customer support. We oftentimes involve our CEO in this process as well because he likes to be engaged in that way. And after you've broadened your investigation, now it's time to refine it down to the, the right set of three, or two or three ideas. And you know, some people you know, give sticky notes to the exec and let them decide. We typically don't do that process. What we like to have is a very rigorous set of priorities that are based on strategic insights and analysis, as well as customer needs and expectations that we know to be true, as well as our, our brand goals and guidelines. So it's a relatively complex set of essentially principles and pr criteria for prioritization that we then apply to these ideas to help the refinement process. It's not just, this looks good, here's a sticky note. It's really, it's fairly rigorous the way that we refine down into one or two principal ideas that we want to test. In this case, we're testing a product. This is a high-fidelity prototype. It was developed in a day by a designer versus over the course of a month by an engineer. Um, within Airbnb, since we're oftentimes designing services, we'll design prototypes for entire buildings. We'll design prototypes for an entire end-to-end -end hospitality experience from booking through transportation into the home and afterwards. We prototype in a lot of different ways. This happens to just be a relatively simple screen-based product prototype. And then you test that prototype with your customers. And here is something happening. There we go. That was slow. Um, we have a, this, this is basically a, um, <coughs> uh, an, a recording of a testing session. We had 10 different guests come in and test this prototype around hotels. So we get feedback on the concept. And what I like to do is oftentimes do this rapid iterative testing and evaluation process where we'll have around 10 to 30 people come in, 10 to 30 customers come in, and then we'll uh, test around five of them a day with a prototype. And after that day, we'll debrief and discuss what we learned, and then we'll iterate on the prototype and test a different prototype that's been slightly remodeled with a new set of, of customers. And so we'll do that rapidly. We can do that with different forms of prototypes as well. Okay, so that's the basic process for this particular project. Again, when I think about design thinking, it really is just a product development methodology. It's not a solution for everything, but it's a great way to tie those customer needs and expectations into your process. And you know, when I think about innovation here, it's really in a number of different ways. And we'll talk about like big eye innovation and little eye innovation. Hotels and Airbnb, how to do that successfully. That's, that's a big eye innovation. That's a really big project. That's going to take us years to get right. Now, how to deploy the next version of an interface for a hotel product over the next three months, that's little eye innovation. If we get that right, we actually grow revenue, right? And we increase the connection between Airbnb and the hotels that are on our platform. We have a number of different goals for that. But we know we can be successful with that particular project in the course of two to three months. So we're scoping the effort down. It's lower risk, it's also lower reward, but we're still using the design thinking process for it. And this process isn't linear. Typically, we'll give teams a set of time. We'll say, okay, you've got a quarter, you've got a set of goals you've agreed to, and you've got a number of different projects you want to execute. You can use this process within the context of that quarter, and you'll be going back and forth. You're not always going in a straight line. You're oftentimes going back and forth. And we're not micromanaging the process. We're, what we're doing is we're trying to set up goals and objectives for the ultimate output, which is that you're releasing products that are making an impact in people's lives, that you're responding to, ch to change in a good and responsible manner, and then ideally, you're doing things in a way that's growing the business over time. OK, so that's the first part of design thinking. The second part, the important part, is this commitment by companies to adapt, adapt innovation. And so it takes a commitment from the top. 
from me, from you in this room, it's important for you to commit to innovation from the top in word and in deed and in investment. And it also takes, and if you do that, you're going to get more and better ideas coming up from the bottom. People will across your organization will feel empowered. They'll know, they'll hear about examples of people who have had innovative ideas in response to change or in response to customer needs that have been greenlit and blessed. And you'll get more of it. You know, you've got now these spark plugs of innovation at your company. They've got, you've got the right set of culture that's setting expectations with them. And now you're rewarding that behavior, you know, and in fact endorsing it and funding it. So this is the way that I organize my team's portfolio of investments. Uh, this isn't universal across Airbnb, but this is the way that I, I organize it. So I've got some little I and then some big I innovation. But 40% of my team is focusing on foundational work. It's really keep the lights on. We've got to keep the business moving ahead. The other 40% is focusing on that quarterly set of goals. And these are projects that we think are relatively low-hanging fruit. We know that if we execute on them, they're going to meet a customer need, which we'll see realized in lower customer support calls, um, or it will grow the business in some sort of way. And again, we, we apply design thinking to the projects, to develop the projects in this 40%. Then the last 20% are the more high-risk projects. So these are things like the Super Guest program, which we announced a while back that we're still it's still under development. How does loyalty work with an Airbnb? That's a really big, challenging problem. There's a lot of dynamics within the company that, that help us determine what's the right path for that. Or hotels and Airbnb, another one. This is a big eye problem. It's going to take us you know, years to actually get right. But we still have that 20% investment in our resources to, to tackle it. OK, so when Larry was speaking about this yesterday, you know, it's important to hold executives accountable for these projects. You know, it should be part of their performance evaluation. Are you supporting 20% of your resources or whatever number makes sense for your organization? And are you not taking it away? So we, we actually have a number of teams that we call incubation teams. Uh, they're part of my, my team in the guest organization. But <clears throat> I actually have them sitting in a different part of the building. And I try to earmark them. So if this 40% here of near-term growth is at risk, I have a very difficult time getting that 20% that I've allocated in a different area and a different project to claw back to like increase that 40%. So we're maintaining investment in the 20% big eye, longer term, bigger payout projects. Okay, so that's design thinking in a nutshell. So what have we learned today? Well, first we've learned about these three primary forces of change that are affecting all companies in the 21st century. We've also learned that if you have a humanistic mission, you'll be able to attract the right kind of people to your company. They're the source of innovation, and they're the spark plugs that are going to help you be responsive to change. We've learned that if you can establish an innovative culture, you'll give direction to your company's employees as you grow and scale, and you'll empower them to take risks, be owners, identify opportunities for change, and then drive that forward. And lastly, we've learned that design thinking as a methodology is a way to tie this all together, to bring your customer into your product development process, product or service development process. And if you can do all of this, my belief is that you can not only um, uh, uh, defend against and, in fact, thrive in the face of these three primary uh, forces of change, but really any force of change that comes down, you'll be able to adapt and thrive ultimately from it. So thank you. So there's, there's huge depth in there. Um, let's kind of go back to the mission piece. So it's, um, you're, you're in quite a rare situation having worked with these very powerful, world-changing uh, companies. Um, the first question, assuming there is a powerful mission, what have you seen work and what have you seen not work in terms of how people actually engage with it? Do you stick it on the door or is it yeah. you know, on someone's, you know? Yeah. Like, what, what processes to engage with it? Is it just there when you get hired and you never see it again, or...? Yeah, the, so if I were to compare Google to Uber to Airbnb, um, so, so Google has this great onboarding process where you learn about their, their mission and their values, um, but it, you don't see it around. Um, it's, it's there, but it's, it's kind of difficult to find. Um, Uber, on the other hand, uh, was very serious about um, their mission and, and the cultural values they wanted to institute. And so uh, I'll tell you a story about how uh, TK uh, instituted these cultural values um, in Uber. So in 2015, after we hit a billion rides, uh, the entire company was um, transported to uh, uh, Las Vegas for a big uh, offsite. And when we were there, 
Uh, one night, we rented out a massive uh, auditorium. So we fit, I think it was over 10,000 employees at that time, into this auditorium. And uh, we spent 15 minutes covering each one of those cultural values in detail. And then a member from, from the audience who had been you know, pre-vetted and selected, who would basically be the personification of that, of that cultural value, gave a bit of a speech on what they had done. Okay? So that was three hours of indoctrination on your cultural values. And it, you know, people were getting a little bit bored after three hours. I mean, you're in Vegas, and you're sitting in this room for three hours and like, listening to these cultural values. And you're getting a little bit, but like, that was the start. You get back to the office, cultural values are on every screen and every conference room. Okay? They were baked into the performance evaluation process. When you're evaluating people, you evaluate them on a number of criteria, performance, um, like the what and the how, and then by the cultural values. Um, we were encouraged, and I think this is actually a good practice, because I do think it's really important if you have a set of cultural values you believe in, it is important to create infrastructure to communicate them within your organization to align people. So I actually think these practices are not a bad, bad practices to, um, to establish if you have the right values. Um, but then we were encouraged to uh, recognize people based on their, um, their impact in terms of the cultural values. So if somebody on your team had demonstrated the cultural values in some sort of way, shape, or form, uh, managers would send out group emails periodically saying, we want to recognize these people. So outside of the performance cycle, people were being recognized, which everybody loves to be recognized, but within this specific framework for recognition. Airbnb, on the other hand, um, you know, we use the cultural values as a sort of that screener. The, the, we have the cultural values interviewers, which helps us kind of maintain uh, the culture of our tribe. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, you also have the cultural values oftentimes on screen, so people can read them and remember them. It's a lot to remember, but you know, once you start reading through them and you start to, you know, to, to really get them, um, it does help you make decisions. I think it's really important actually to do that. Yeah, and you said two thirds of millennials uh, kind of choose a company based on that uh, to some extent. Um, I've certainly seen that. I always ask people why you're here. Yeah. And normally they're here because of the impact they believe the company can have. Um, but. With Uber and with Airbnb, I use those products, but I've never seen the emission as a customer. No. And your experience is it primarily there as an internal uh, motivator to effectively align people's work and values, etc. Or should it be customer facing? I think it. Well, it, I, there's no one size fits all, you know, mm. recommendation here. But I do think that um, if companies are willing to wear their um, their purpose on their sleeve because they're proud of their purpose, I think it's a wonderful thing. Mm. Um, does it mean that it's important for companies to put their purpose up front in the middle of their website? Probably not because people are just trying to figure out what the hell you do in the first place. And the purpose sometimes conflicts with the fact that you're shipping a certain type of product. Um, and so there might be certain points within the, within the customer life cycle to introduce them to your purpose. Um, and we do that actually at Airbnb. We have a, we have a, a basically it's a, a guest commitment. When you book a listing, you have to basically commit to being a good guest. And our values come through, and our purpose comes through in that guest commitment. But we're not overt with the pronunciation that this is our purpose. Um, I think another one that's really interesting is is Tesla. Right? You're buying a Tesla because you're, I mean, one, you think it's a beautiful product, but two, you're buying into, you know, Elon Musk's vision. And that is essentially to maintain life <laughs> on Earth, or maybe life on Mars, but like maintain life at all costs, right? And so um, if you're interested in sustainable you know, transportation, um, you, you know that that's actually Tesla's mission. I don't think they're very shy about that being their mission. So I think it depends on the, the company. Well, we've had uh, quite a bit of feedback, well, from people saying, I don't think our mission's strong enough, or it's like, oh, how do you rethink these things? Have you got any reflections? You know, because often people have something which may be 10 years old and it's a bit more functional. You know, we want to be the best at, you know, yeah. growing apples or something, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's more kind of a more functional type one, yeah. as opposed to when you're saying focus more on the outcome, you know, the impact the organization can have on humanity. How do you bridge that? Uh, you know, say, say there's some people, there's a, someone who's got 50 employees, they're on a growth period. Well, what are your thoughts on uh, how people could actually kind of rework that and elevate it? I mean, I think the, the first step there is just having the, you know, the, the boldness to consider that as an option when refactoring your mission statement. 
I mean, you, you know, it, it, you may think that it's a sort of a form of humility not to think about how your company might be able to impact um, a sphere larger than your particular market or your particular region in the world. Um, and, you know, maybe the reality is that your interests aren't larger than that, which is fine, but I do think it's a useful exercise to, um, you know, embrace the boldness that comes with thinking about having an impact that's larger than your, you know, your region or larger than your current market or larger than your current set of customers and try to think a bit more globally. And just that, that push to do that, I think, could potentially unlock um, different insights and potentially even lead to different insights about how your business might be oriented. Sometimes I've seen companies get the drug a bit where they go from, oh my God, we've got no innovation in this place to innovating everything and they get kind of an mm -hmm. innovation you know, yeah. paralysis type yeah. thing. How do you, what, what is the process to choosing what a good kind of portfolio looks like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how do you balance playing with everything versus kind of doing nothing? Too much long term versus too much short term. Uh, so I'm, this is it's going to be a very pragmatic answer. Again, you know, I'm I'm managing a, a product right now. Um, I'm not, you know, a, a sort of you know academic who looks at you know the sort of macro scale way that companies have balanced innovation portfolios. Um, so I'm I'm giving you a response from somebody who today is looking at you know my. Q1 results and I'm not happy <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what we do in Q2 to actually move things forward. Um, and so the way that I typically think about this is that you start with, you know, your primary goals uh, as, um, as a company or if you're running a particular segment of business, what are the primary goals for your, for your segment? And ideally your goals have a mix. It's not just growth. It's things like you know, are your customers satisfied? You have a way to measure that. Do you create a great quality product? How are you measuring quality? You have a multiple different sort of vectors of measurement. And so that's your sort of stable set of near-term bets. <clears throat> and those stable set of near-term bets should ladder up to what's close to your goal for the quarter or for the half, okay? And then on top of that, you layer the speculative. And so if you have the ability to allocate resources on top of what you see as your baseline metrics for growth and your baseline outcomes for growth, that's where you then apply those additional resources onto those innovative, more big I type bets. And so the way that we, at least at Airbnb, conduct these big I type bets, we'll typically have one to two, maybe three people who are really, really senior and really, really good focusing on nurturing these. Because we want to make sure that when they're ready to blossom into real initiatives that we're going to invest more resources in, that they actually have the right strategy and that we're not making a mistake. So that's how we typically, that's how we typically organize it. So, you know, for example, um, the, uh, you know, this notion of um, guest loyalty or, or loyalty program, that's something that we're, we're incubating right now. And mm -hmm. we've got a really great idea around it, but we're, we're, you know, we're waiting to make sure we have all the pieces in place before we're ready to take that one out and then start building all the, all the different pieces that need to actually come together in order for us to release that product to the world. So we've got a, just a few people um, on that project, and those few people are cordoned off from the rest of the organization that's focused on the goals that we have for the next half of the year. Mm. And final question, so this ideation phase when you've kind of you know, worked out, you know, you've got your portfolio, here's three things, okay, let's take this. You've really defined the, the problem. So you see a couple of things. One, you bring people from across the organization mm -hmm. into the process, mm -hmm. so it's not just the designers doing it. Mm -hmm. And then two, you said, to break out of that issue that many companies have where the senior person or the founder or something jumps to a solution, you develop multiple ways of looking at the problem. Yeah. And then you showed a slide with all these different ways of doing it. A lot of companies that um, I've been working with in this process get really stuck <laughs> at that point. They go, oh my goodness, there's so many ways to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that kind of creating choices is kind of easy, and the making choices pieces is really, really hard mm -hmm. because it has impact. And a lot of people love creating optionality and actually hate making decisions. Mm -hmm. So what are your reflections on what a good process is to actually drive this thing to an outcome so it doesn't yeah. just keep on kind of spinning its wheels? Yeah, I think first you need to time box it. <laughs> Set expectations that this is not going, you know, you, you can't you can't do this for you know a year if we think that it would actually it should take you you know a month to complete, um, which you know it, it, 
just in, in practice of being a good manager, you don't want to micromanage the process. You want to give people the tools and let them execute on the process. And so setting those high-level expectations, you know, you've got to get a result by this time versus letting it continue indefinitely is one way to ensure that, that you're able to provide that top-down top guidance on what your expectations are for that, um, for that iteration. I think the other one is decomposing, and it's just a general practice, decomposing problems down to their basic core sort of building blocks. And so when I, in that slide that I showed all these different problems that we could solve around hotels and Airbnb, those are problems that we will solve. And those problems are at different sort of sizes. And it's important for us to just decompose down and, and really go from a level of like ambiguity into a level of very like precision associated with each of the things that we need to solve in order to build up to this grander vision of hotels and Airbnb. And when you break them down into these smaller building blocks, the decision-making process around each one of those, if you run them through this overarching design thinking cycle, you're able to get all the customer empathy and get the ideas and refine them and then test them individually, and then you can put them all together into your bigger strategy for whatever your larger scale initiative is. Cool. So Ethan, yeah. thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely.